And with that, please give a warm Northwood South Shore of Lake Superior welcome mm -hmm. to Gordon Stevenson. Well, this is a, a rather incredible crowd. I'm, I'm, I'm very gratified to see uh, so many folks here to participate in this particular uh, 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 event. I've got a rather unusual title here of, of what I'm going to tell you about. It will unfold shortly. Uh, as this, this goes on, where that title came from. As you might detect in my voice, I didn't come from here. I, I came from, let's say, Point South. My first exposure to the North Woods was through the, the uh, truly wonderful tall tales of Paul Bunyan. <laughs> one, of those tall one of those Paul Bunyan tall tales that I liked particularly was how the Great Lakes were formed, and that's Paul dug the Great Lakes uh, so that his great ox, great blue ox, could have a watering hole. Now I'm going to be very careful with that particular story because there will already be people saying that the purpose of the Great Lakes was for livestock management. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, now there's Paul and the great blue ox. I want to tell you one other tall tale, though. This, this one is a little bit closer to home for me, and it's just a bit more lurid. This is the, uh, uh, what some of you may, may know as the famous story of the crossroads in Clarksdale, Mississippi. It's where Highway 61 and Highway 49 meet. That particular location was where the devil himself taught Robert Johnson how to play the blues. Now, Robert Johnson uh, went on to have a very illustrious career playing the blues. Everyone copied him. He died in 1938. And at that point, Robert Johnson had, deliver, had to deliver his end of the bargain, and that was his soul went to the devil in exchange for learning to play the blues. I'm going to start doing now what I'm supposed to, and that's to talk a little bit about manure management, particularly manure management in Wisconsin. Those, so this is Manure Management 101. It's my dubious distinction to be a manure expert. <laughs> I issued the first CAFO permits in Wisconsin, so, so a, a, a lot of this is my fault, I guess. Uh, I worked for the Department of Natural Resources for 26 years. And the very first thing I learned about manure management was not anything chemical or biological or agricultural, but it is cultural. That is to say we have a very big problem in Wisconsin about how we view farmers and how we view manure. We revere farmers and farming in this state. We celebrate dairy farming with bucolic scenes embroidered on, on walls and um, memorialize the fact of how much we like farming on the back of every vehicle and we even dress ourselves up in cheese heads. <laughs> Somehow farming, we at least in the cultural perceptions, is viewed as wholesome, noble and endearing, and that's actually getting in the way of having objective discussions about this. Now, in addition to those cheese heads and the needlepoint on the wall, contaminated wells and manure stroke st choked streams are not good subjects for embroidery. Unfortunately, this is increasingly the legacy of many, particularly rural residents in Wisconsin. The livestock industry, particularly the larger, those in, with larger livestock operations, concentrated animal units, or CAFOs, are going to tell you how rigorously they're regulated. They will tell you they have to get a permit, just like a pulp and paper mill or, or or uh, uh, the, the publicly owned sewage treatment works of large cities. There is about a century of difference between the technology that CAFOs are expected 
to, to deploy versus the technologies that, that, let us say, a pulp and paper mill would have to deploy. Let me give you an example. A pulp and paper mill has to, have, has to measure some of the pollutants that they remove from their wastewater down to the nanogram. Now, what's a nanogram? Well, a nanogram is basically a drop of vermouth in a sea of gin. That's, that's how far down they go. The lowest unit of measurement for ICAFO is a ton. So there's a great difference there. Livestock agriculture and technology. Manure management has not changed one iota, except in some very minor ways, since the Middle Ages. That is, manure is spread untreated onto the land surface. You should understand that in the middle, that in the 1940s, there were twice as many dairy cattle in Wisconsin as there is now. However, there is now three times the milk production that's happened. Now, now, you're probably might be more interested in, in uh, hog production today, but I want to talk a little bit more about the dairy industry because that's where bit the lion's share of the business is, has been with concentrated animal feeding operations. That industry has, has, has really made a six-fold increase in milk production with improvements in housing, feeding programs, genetics, etc. That's because there is a profit motive involved in doing that. With that said, though, there is no profit involved in manure management, and thus they continue to spread it untreated onto the land surface. There have been a couple of tweaks, and as far as I am concerned, those tweaks are worse than was done in the Middle Ages. Those, there are two tweaks. One, the sheer volume of animal waste, of manure that we have, particularly that comes from a CAFO. And the second it, the, is the fact that it is now an incredibly dilute liquid system, taking the same tack as we have in terms of how they want to manage waste. And that is by water carriage. So massive volumes of water are now used to, to, to transport and handle that manure. It is cheaper to, to operate pumps than it is to push, lift, pull, etc. Solid, solid material. Manure runoff events. I, I was involved with this with, for over a quarter of a century. I'm showing you some data up there from, from the, the year 2006, and I've got, got a couple of, couple of wrinkles there in, in the quality of the slide. I had my 15-month-old grand, grandson was uh, uh, on, on one knee as I was putting these slides together, so you'll cut me a little slack there. I want to call your attention to, to the, the largest part of that pie chart that says land spreading 75%. What that means in that particularly bad year, in 2006, the numbers of, of water quality impacts that occurred from manure management came from land spreading of that dilute liquid manure that I was talking about. So for my money, where I would go to look for solutions is in that land spreading type of activity. This is the, the, the uh, uh, distrib distribution of livestock in Wisconsin right now. I won't go through the whole thing, but I would like you to take a look at the, at the first number and the last number. The first number says that Wisconsin has 3.4 million cattle. The last number says Wisconsin has about 5.5 million people. While at DNR, and in fact DNR still uses this, the potential for, for a cow to pollute, one cow equals 18 people, and that's based on a very common measure of, of, of water pollution, and that's called biochemical oxygen demand. So keep that number in mind. Now here, 
Where are you going with this, Gordon? Here's a picture of Tokyo, Japan. It is the most populous city in the world, and it has almost 38 million people. Arguably, the second most populous city in the world is Mexico City, with its 21 million people. Here's the punchline of all this. If you take that 3.4 million head of cattle in Wisconsin, not even including all the other types of livestock, multiply it by 18, you get 60 million people. Add up the, the first and second most populous cities on the planet, you get 60 million people. So the largest cities in Wisconsin are not Milwaukee and Madison. They are Tokyo and Mexico City populated by livestock. Here's a football field that we've all, many of us have come to know and love, Lambeau Field. Five stories high. A typical dairy cattle that we see now being permitted by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources will fill up Lambeau Field four times per year. Now, uh, let's get, get down to something of maybe greater local interest. I'd like to thank Dr. Neil K. Nachman and his staff and his colleagues who put together this that basically said that, that the, the uh, uh, Badgerwood facility will equal approximately 50,000 people in terms of, of the amount of waste produced. Now, what does that really mean? What that means is that Badgerwood will have a, an equivalent population of La Crosse, Wisconsin. Now, let's imagine that La Crosse, Wisconsin writes Bayfield County a letter and they say, we really don't want to pay for that expensive sewage treatment plant anymore. We're just going to load everything up in tanker trucks, head them north, spread them out in, in proximity spread that material out in proximity to rural residents of the north uh, and in proximity to 10% to of the world's fresh water. I think that's what the La Crosse Chamber of Commerce had in mind when they said, let's share the La Crosse experience. <laughs> However, that's precisely what Badger Wood proposes. I want to talk about a couple of myths, and I'm really reluctant to do this because this is part of the program that I came from. The current Wisconsin system of rules, best management practices, and programs for concentrated animal feeding operations and other livestock operations protect the environment and protect public health. That is not so, and I'm sorry to say that. There, I, in my career, I have seen greater than 50 major fish kills occur. This is after the rules were in place. I have seen extreme surface runoff occur to, to lakes and streams. I have seen something that really broke my heart, and this just has happened in the last couple of years, a dead zone out in Green Bay just like the dead zone that has occurred at the Gulf of Mexico in the Mississippi River. The problem here is agriculture. There is an agricultural excess going on in the watershed that grain drains into Green Bay. If you look at the extent of this dead zone, the city of Green Bay is down at the bottom and about, about uh, two-thirds of the way up is the city of Marinette. And you notice the red zone. That's how big that dead zone has been measured. There isn't much of anything that's growing in there. Public health. I want to talk about, about a few uh, among many of public health impacts that have occurred as a result of, of agricultural activity. In the town of Morrison in Brown County, more than 100 water supply wells were polluted by agricultural runoff in the year 2006. It included 
parasites, bacteria, and residents suffered from chronic diarrhea, stomach illnesses, and severe ear infections. Very few people in the state know about this. This was a public health calamity. A hundred wells, a hundred families, all polluted by, by, by manure, basically. The Trimmel family in Kewanee County is a rural dwelling, a Wisconsin family not unlike my own family, except a bit younger. They had three healthy, happy daughters. In 2004, they faced a nightmare that no family should ever face. All of the family members were, were, were stricken very ill with their four-month-old daughter stricken critically. She could have died. And now come up to the year 2014 and what's happened in Kiwani County. I think Lynn Utesh is probably going to be telling you about the fact that 30% of the wells countywide now are either bacteriologically or contaminated with nitrates, all uh, associated with manure. Uh, he's going to tell you about that at least one township, 50% of the wells are contaminated. Now people are saying, well, no, there hasn't really been a public health crisis. We've had them. We're having them now. They're ongoing right now. And while Walkerton, Ontario is a long way from Wisconsin, I think what happened there is pr prophetic. That's a small community in, in, in uh, Canada. 2,300 people were stricken ill. Seven people died as a result of, of animal waste, of cattle manure running into their municipal water supply. Talking a bit about nitrate, antibiotics, the list can go on and on. I want to talk about, about groundwater and nitrates. 75% of us in Wisconsin get our water supply from the groundwater. Nitrate is the most common uh, uh, contaminant in Wisconsin groundwater. Greater than 10% of the water supply wells statewide exceed the 10 milligram per liter drinking water standard for nitrate, and 90% of that nitrate contamination comes from agriculture. Pub the public health implications are very serious. Blue baby syndrome, certain forms of cancer, and a possible correlation to, with diabetes uh, are all part of the nitrate problem, and there are other illnesses as well. I want to talk about the central sands just a little bit. That is the central part of the state there, characterized by, by soils that are very, very coarse textured and allow the rapid infiltration of contaminants down to the groundwater. There is already extensive nitrate contamination from chemical fertilizers. There has been widespread use of irrigation agriculture that has helped has assisted driving that nitrogen down to drinking water. And it is the percentage of wells contaminated in the central sands is much higher than the rest of the state, going up to 60% or more in certain localized areas in that part of the state. The northeast part of the state, we're talking Kiwani, Door, uh, 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 Fond du Lac, Brown, etc. Their soils are very thin, overlaying fractured bedrock, making, making their groundwater very, very vulnerable to infiltration of contaminants. Kiwani County is in a public health crisis right now, and I just explained all that. I think this is, is very, very serious. It is a, a it, it is, it's a statewide disgrace, as far as I'm concerned, that this has been allowed to occur. And in fact, an administrative law judge refer, referred to this situation as a massive case of regulatory failure to allow contamination to this degree to occur. I want to talk about 
CAFOs and vulnerable landscapes. Now, as best you can see, that the, the map there of the state basically shows you the distribution of concentrated animal feeding operations around the state. If you look at, at the northeast part, around, at, around Green Bay there, you will see that we have the highest concentrations of CAFOs in the state there. I call that CAFO Alley. It has become overcrowded. That's where, where the, the dead zone in Green Bay is. That's where Kiwani County is. And if you look at, at the way, at the way uh, they are distributed over those counties, you'll see that Brown, Kiwani, and Fond du Lac all have very high concentrations of CAFOs. The Central Sands have become the next go-to places. So the two places where we have some of the highest contaminations of uh, water resources in the state are also where CAFOs have been locating. Kiwani County didn't always have CAFOs. Brown County didn't always have CAFOs. If you look at, at the progression of concentrated animal feeding operation proliferation in this state, you will see in 1985 we had none. Now in, in 2000, actually 2015 now, we are sitting with more than 250 CAFOs with at least 50 more CAFOs that are pending in their applications. <coughs> Kiwani County is an awful lot like Bayfield County, as Mary Doherty has pointed out. Communities that are, are on Great Lakes, communities with a thriving tourist industry. In 1985, Kiwani County had no CAFOs. Now they have 16. It's 2015 now. Bayfield County has no CAFOs. I want to talk about another myth. That myth is that only the state has the authority to regulate livestock operations. There are attorneys for the livestock industry that are putting a lot of effort into trying to convince local units of government that only the state may do any regulatory activity with CAFOs. Don't believe it. It is not true. It is doubly important that you understand that right now. We all know where this is from. Wisconsin is open for business. That, that, that's been, been uh, our governor was elected on that basis. Please understand, however, that the state of Wisconsin has always been reluctant to use its authority with anything to do with agriculture, particularly environmental regulation of agriculture. Remember, remember the, the cheese heads, the, 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 this cultural or social com contract that we live with that actually provides protection for a large-scale livestock industry that is not at all like the livestock industry of yesteryear. It was true during the Thompson administration, the Doyle administration, and now the Walker administration that state government has been friendly to CAFOs. And I am sorry to tell you that I am very concerned about even being able to keep the current CAFO rules that we have such as they are on the books under the current administration. Anyone who comes forward with a business proposal in this particular state government environment is beatified, particularly if that, that proposal involves jobs and no doubt they're going to be accommodated by this industry. I want to tell you a little something about this accommodation. Now you're going to hear, you, you will, the, the tavern talk that you will hear uh, from, from certain livestock operations as we're being regulated into the ground. That's not true. Here's, here's the kind of, kind of program the state is interested in running now. There is a program called the Dairy 30 by 20 initiative to, to grow Wisconsin dairy. We currently produce about 25 billion pounds of milk. It is desired that that number be higher, that it be 30 billion pounds of milk per year. So by the year 2020, Dairy 30 2020 strives to 
produce 30 billion pounds of milk by the year 2020. Now to do that, if doing a little back of the envelope calculation on how many cattle that would provide, that would be 200,000 more dairy cattle. Remembering what I told you about conversion? That's Los Angeles, California. We have Tokyo, Mexico City, and soon maybe we're going to have Los Angeles, California. Now, keep in mind I'm talking about, about what the state might do. The state is going to welcome and accommodate CAFOs. That's going, and it will be compounded if, in fact, the governor is successful with the budget he's proposed. You've all seen it. He wants to complete the job of taking citizen voice out of governance of the Department of Natural Resources. He wants to scientifically bankrupt UW, and he wants to completely disjoint the Department of Natural Resources from science in its, in its decision-making process. He wants to fire anyone who is a scientist at DNR, basically. This will encourage and facilitate KIFOs even more. It should be obvious that if citizens and local units of government do not step up to this challenge, no one else will. Last thoughts. It's certainly not all gloom and doom out there. The, you heard Mary read that long list of farms who have sponsored this event. That's what we have to say in response to the proliferation of concentrated animal feeding operations. Sustainable farming, it, it, much of it right here in the northern counties, I think is the real hope uh, for farming in this state. There has been some very effective local citizen effort that has occurred, and one such effort was right here in Bayfield County with the moratorium, and I'm very pleased about that. I told you that my grandson helped me put this slideshow together. His name is Starker, but I want to tell you about another child. Her name is Samantha. She was the child who was critically stricken with E. coli from land spread manure in Kiwani County in 2004. Samantha could have died. I still lose sleep about this. I can imagine looking into the eyes of Samantha's parents, seeing the sadness, anger, anguish, and fear that they must have experienced seeing their child in a hospital bed in that condition. County government failed Samantha. Natural resources failed Samantha. And this happened on my watch. So I failed Samantha. I hope no one fails Starker. I want to just make a couple of other comments. Where it, the, 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 those landscapes that I showed you that caused the dead zone in Green Bay, or the contamination of the aquifers in the central sands in Kiwani County, those are all symptoms of what I call a bleeding landscape. That is, there has been excessive agricultural material, namely plant nutrient like nitrogen and phosphorus, pathogens and all those other things that have been spread on those landscapes until they literally bleed. And of course, we see the result in the water resources. Where is the next landscape that bleeds? What will be the next major water resource to go down? And what is the name of the next sick child? So imagine yourself some moonlit night at a crossroads, not in Clarksdale, Mississippi, but maybe where 
Curry Road and Fromsel Road meet in the town of Eileen. A stranger in a black suit is standing there. He's friendly and he strikes up a conversation. Soon he's offered you a deal. He tells you he will give you 30 jobs and $3 million. All you have to do is put up the deed to your bank. As your part company, he asks you to think a bit about his offer. He says he will be coming back to the crossroads in a few days, just as soon as he completes a debt collection exercise in Kiwani County. Let's hope this is just a tall tale. Thank you.